Thank you for attending this workshop on natural rearing. I really appreciate being here because as pet parents, all of us, we're all invested in the health and wellness of those that we love. I often teach this workshop to breeders. And so if you're involved in breeding, I speak to you when I say that we are stewards of our breed and it's our responsibility to protect them from genetic diseases and chronic illness. We need to apply the principles of nature to our breeding programs. The purpose of this workshop is to give anyone and everyone an understanding of what natural rearing means. I want you to have some practical and simple ways to apply genetic and naturopathic science to everyday life. Our goal is protecting this generation and future generations from the harm that can be inflicted by the environment and offer healthier puppies to our clients and in the process continue to bring in more funds to keep our programs healthy and growing. I mean, we all want our breeders still around the next time we want a puppy. So who am I to be telling you about what natural rearing is? So I'm Paula Vandervoort. I am the founder of the Dog Breeder Store. I'm the founder of Gentry Boxers and Boston Terriers. I have a BS in biology. It focuses on reproductive physiology and sciences as a breeder. It's a pre-vet degree. I have nearly two decades of higher level education in alternative medicine for animals. I'm a speaker and educator at breed clubs and a lot of holistic animal events. Uh, I've got a consulting business in animal wellness and I've studied animal naturopathy. I am a carnivore nutritionist and I'm a silver leader in Young Living. It's an essential oil company. So I hate to say it, but I've got 50 years as a senior breeder of boxers always and occasionally other breeds and the last few generations have been completely naturally reared. Sometimes I'm a mentor to other breeders but especially in the areas of using mother nature's supports instead of the more toxic methods that I was taught as a young breeder. So I've co-founded the Natural Rearing Breeder Connection. That's an organization that's founded to educate breeders and buyers about the benefits of using natural rearing techniques to breed and whelp and raise puppies and kittens. We connect breeders and buyers together through this organization. It requires its member breeders to adhere to a natural rearing code of ethics. We teach about feeding carnivores a whole food, raw meat-based diet. We teach about cleaning nurseries with things like the VMAA approved Thieves Household Cleaner. And we teach about the use of natural supports instead of synthetics for pain, for surgery, wound care, injuries, whelping, training, parasite control, immunity to disease. We advocate the use of young living essential oils and products along with a system of medicine called homeopathics, organic herbs, and whole foods in place of prescription and over-the-counter medicines. As a founder of the Gentry Boxers Natural Rearing Group on Facebook, it's a private Facebook group that started with eight clients. We were all learning about natural rearing together. We now have a group of over a thousand alternative health professionals, carnivore nutrition experts, homeopaths, and a lot of pet parents and breeders who are interested in learning about natural rearing. And I invite you to join us. I'm the founder and the co-owner of the Dog Breeder Store. We cater to the needs of dog breeders with supplies and services, but many are geared towards natural rearing. And we've been in business since 2013. What I'm hoping that you'll take away from this is what natural rearing is and why is it important. I want to give you a brief understanding of what it means. And I want to give you some practical examples that you can employ right now. I want to tell you about the results you can expect and that we've been seeing and how it affects pricing of the dogs and also client loyalty. And I'll give you some resources to learn more and get connected with others. So I'm going to start with the bad news, but then we're going to have some good news. These are just a few on this list of the health issues that really did not exist when I first started breeding. I've seen a lot of trends since I started as a young adult breeding and being around now as an oldie but a goodie for over 50 years as a breeder. 
I've observed a lot of trends in my own breed and others as well. I've seen a lot of new breeds emerge, become popular, but honestly, the most disturbing trend I've seen is an absolutely dismal decline in health and longevity in most breeds. I've watched as my own breed of boxers seems to be dying much younger and experiencing many more health issues at younger ages. We began seeing cancer in puppies under a year old. We, we were seeing dogs with epilepsy, which I had never seen before. We were seeing dogs dropping dead in living rooms in front of clients, children of heart issues that didn't exist in the 50s and 60s. We've seen skyrocketing issues with autoimmune thyroiditis and with aberrant behavior. We've seen anxious dogs through the roof, especially separation anxiety. We've seen aggression and we've seen yeast system wide. We've seen IBS, diabetes didn't exist, and uncontrollable itching, number one reason dogs now go to the vet. We've seen lower fertility and smaller litter sizes with a lot of failure to conceive and failure for puppies to thrive. According to the Veterinary Cancer Society, 50% of dogs over the age of 10 are diagnosed with cancer, and one in four dogs will develop cancer at some point before that. Approximately 6 million new cancer diagnoses are made in dogs annually. And this is just for the ones who receive veterinary care and actually get a formal diagnosis. And according to a recent State of Pet Health report by Banfield, the prevalence of diabetes in dogs is increasing by a whopping 80%. Seizures, they're now one of the most common neurological conditions diagnosed in dogs, with up to 5% having a seizure in their lifetime. There are a few of us from the old days who had never even heard of these issues. And now I'll bet that many of you pet parents and breeders that in the past decade that have helped your clients, you've probably helped them through many of these health issues. And according to a 2020 study, nearly 73% of dogs exhibit at least one anxiety related behavior, you know, with the largest one being separation anxiety and noise anxieties under lightning. And you know, um, one of the most common diagnoses in veterinary medicine is yeast infections of the ears. And a growing number now find yeast infections going systemic. They cause skin issues and systemic itching, itching. In today's world, depending on the breed, most people expect dogs on the average to live to be around nine to 11 years, right? Depends on the breed, you know, the smaller ones live longer, the bigger ones don't tend to live as long. But if you talk to veterinarians who were practicing in the 70s and people like me, we'll all tell you that dogs are living to be 16, 17, 18 years old on the regular. And the studies prove that this decrease in lifespan is real. There was a long-term study done by the UK Kennel Club that showed what I was seeing all around me to be true. There's not a single breed living longer due to all the advancements in medicine and kibble research. In fact, they're all living much shorter lives. In my own breed, we are losing approximately 1.4 years in every 10. My breed of boxers was living on average 11.3 years in the year 2004. And by 2014, the average was then 10. There was an 11% drop in median longevity in just 10 years for all the breeds they studied. And I would bet that it is still dropping based on my own observations. So natural rearing fits into this picture very nicely. Um, it encompasses you know, what most breeders, ethical breeders, consider the highest tenants that we've always been accepting for ethical and responsible breeding. You know, those include things like knowing your breed's confirmation and health issues, knowing what's in those pedigrees, doing the health screening required by the parent breed clubs, making sure your progeny can do the jobs they were designed to do by using competitive testing and trials and proper pu puppy socialization using programs such as early neurological stimulation and puppy culture. Those are really fun things and a lot of breeders do them. But what's been added and so very important is that the diet fed by a natural rearing breeder is never processed. A natural rearing breeder feeds a whole food, species appropriate, raw meat diet based on one of the standards that are accepted 
There are several. They're fine, like genetic-based feeding, BARF, SARF, the 80-10-10, 80% muscle meat, 10% bone, 10% organ. But with all of us now understanding that food really is medicine and diet is the foundation to good health, no longer can we accept highly processed garbage disguised as dog food, which is really feed, as being anything other than what it is. It's crap in a bag. Dogs are not evolved anatomically or chemically to eat dead processed food with no chi, that's energy, with synthetic vitamins sprayed on them and synthetic flavorings to make the dogs actually want to eat them. Without those additives, no dog except those starving would actually eat any kibble any company can conjure up. And with the advent of products such as Roundup, commercial systemic poisons used to control fleas and parasites, and eye-burning harsh cleaners containing endocrine disruptors and insecticides and pesticides, they've all done immeasurable harm to our dogs. They're closer to the ground. They're licking everything that touches their bodies and experiencing many of the symptoms that we never saw before, like grand mal seizures. I was in the vet's office uh, last week with my boxer and a person's Frenchie was having seizures in front of me. He'd just been dosed with Simparica, and the vet's office was telling me that they had, this was a common occurrence. And a girlfriend of mine who had a champion boxer girl dosed her with Trifexis, and she was dead in 15 minutes with a grand mal seizure. These are real things. And because we now have a growing list of debilitating adverse reactions to vaccines, a natural rearing breeder finds alternatives to injections to help a dog's body become strongly immune to pathogens such as parvo and distemper, worms, fleas. There are much safer ways that don't involve big pharma products that achieve strong immunity without compromising health. The only vaccine that a natural rearing breeder is even allowed to give is rabies. And many don't You actually give rabies because it's virtually been wiped out in canines in the United States. The laws have not kept up with the science, and over-vaccination has done way more harm than the diseases they're purported to prevent. They're laden with heavy metals and foreign animal proteins, and rabies, unfortunately, is the most reactive of all the shots. So many of us find other ways to protect our dogs while staying within the letter of the law. This isn't a complete list. Our code of ethics is listed at the Natural Rearing Breeder Connection. But we will meet anyone on this journey at any place they are, even if you're just putting a raw egg on a bowl of kibble. It's the start to raw feeding, and it's better than a highly processed kibble diet. And if you are a breeder, you need to know that the decisions you're making when you decide what diet to feed and what chemicals to use, they affect three generations. Did you know that when a female dog is pregnant, the care she receives directly impacts three different generations, the mother dog, her puppies, and the developing eggs inside of any female puppies she's carrying. Females develop all the eggs they'll ever shed during their lifetime while they are still a fetus in the womb. If the fetus in the diagram goes on to have her own puppies, consider that any resulting female puppies she has would have been an egg inside their mother when she was in the womb herself. When you understand that things like stress and environmental toxins and nutrition, they can actually alter how a gene is expressed. You can see how the care of the mother dog can affect not only her and her offspring, but also the third generation, those eggs that are already inside that fetus. So as a breeder, I have to be very conscious that I'm working with three generations at a time if I do things that damage the mother, she passes that damage on. And if I do things that support her, like using natural supports, feeding a fantastic raw diet, and keeping my environment clear of toxins, I can actually affect her gene expression through a process called epigenetics. So beyond those three generations, the environment and lifestyle of an animal has the power to affect its genome by way of epigenetic changes. The DNA doesn't actually change, it remains unchanged, but epigenetic modifications alter how a gene is expressed, sort of completely turning on or off a gene. 
Epigenetic changes can also then be inherited from parents to offspring through multiple generations. So disease doesn't necessarily happen just by chance or bad luck. There's always a reason, always a cause, and gene expression is a part of it. I want to give you just a few examples that you can start with right now um, just to get started with natural rearing and alternative medicine. There's a system of medicine called homeopathics. I'll tell you a little bit about that. You can also use plant medicine. Uh, at Gentry Boxers, we use essential oils. We only use medical grade essential oils. We don't use anything over the counter. Those are perfumes and they are toxic to dogs. So they need to be medical grade, biologically active essential oils. We also use non-toxic cleaners and purifications for our nursery. So we're gonna talk a little bit about those. So the first thing I wanted to talk about is homeopathic medicine. A lot of people confuse homeopathics with holistic medicine. They're not at all the same thing. Homeopathics are an actual system of medicine and home means homonym or seminal, similar or like and pathy means pathology. So the meaning of the word homeopathy is actually in the word. It's a system of medicine that is both preventive and treatment based but it's based on symptoms. Homeopathic medicine is one of the oldest and most revered medical systems in the world. It was developed in the late 1700s in Germany. It's widely used in Europe and most first and second world countries. It's the medical system of choice for the late Queen of England and we all know how long she lived. It was established in America with the first homeopathic college in Allentown, Pennsylvania in 1835. Then Big Pharma was responsible for pressuring practitioners to use more profitable prescription medications. They were patentable, so they could charge more. Homeopathy has a global popularity that far exceeds its use in the U.S. In Europe, approximately 40% of all physicians either use or refer patients to homeopathy. It's part of the national health care systems of Germany, Switzerland, the United Kingdom, Greece, Israel, India, Pakistan, and Mexico. And the World Health Organization states that homeopathic medicine is the second most popular medicine in use. Veterinarians can get an accreditation from the Pitcairn Institute of Veterinary Homeopathy. It's a 140 credit hour accreditation for DVMs. They can learn how to use homeopathy in their practices. So one of the homeopathics that breeders often use is called fading puppy remedy. It's a 100% homeopathic preparation. It's regulated and licensed by the FDA in the United States and it's made in a licensed homeopathic pharmacy. It's based on a century old formula from Europe and it's been modernized by me. As a homeopathic it is extremely safe for pregnant moms especially when they have a history of loss and for newborns who are struggling. It actually addresses the energetics of why a puppy fades. It basically teaches the puppy's body how to heal itself by providing the encoding of the homeopathic instructions. It's pretty cool stuff. And most of us have been exposed by now to the dangers of vaccinating young puppies and an understanding of maternal antibodies blocking them. And the propensity to over vaccinate, it's been slowly withdrawing from the veterinary and breeding communities. There have been research projects such as Do Dr. Ron Schultz's University of Wisconsin studies. Uh, he studied the side effects and efficacies of vaccines in dogs. And you can read about their, uh, those from him. So how do you protect your puppies if you're not gonna vaccinate or if you're thinking about not vaccinating? Well. You need an extreme immune system in place. You need great diet and you need gut microbiome supplementation, probiotics, for example. You can also consider using homeopathic nosodes. They can augment immunity to the usual puppy diseases. There's a lot to know about how nosodes work. They're not at all like vaccines. They don't carry the risks of vaccines. And honestly, we've had several unvaccinated puppies get parvo who have left our nursery but they've been naturally reared with no sods and raw diet, and they've gone through parvo like a mild cold. This is a workshop all on its own, but it's well worth learning about. So 
that's fading puppy remedy. There are also homeopathics available to help a dog through the whelping process safely. In particular, I love the homeopathics called colophyllum and gelsimium. They help with stalled labors. There's a homeopathic called hypericum for pain, and I love calendula to prevent infections. And the one I use on myself and my girl is Califos. It really helps when energy is low in the nursery. So we offer a homeopathic whelping kit with a set of instructions that caters to breeders and dogs at our store as well. We even have homeopathics for kennel cough. They're very effective for both prevention and early treatment. And then we're going to talk about nosodes here in just a minute. So one more thing about fading puppies, if you breed long enough, you will have a puppy that fades. It's called fading puppy syndrome. And um, we have a remedy for fading puppy that is homeopathic. We pair it up with a biologically active uh, puppy, fading puppy support and a book that go, goes into a deep dive of what fading puppy syndrome is how you recognize it, how you treat it, how you prevent it. So this is an entire kit that is available from the dog breeder store. It's, it's quite newly released and it has a homeopathic remedy and a biologically active product with it as well. I mentioned nosodes. So nosodes are homeopathic remedies but they're prepared from disease tissues, like materials uh, from a diseased animal, fluids, discharges, parvosnot. The homeopathic rem uh, manufacturing process actually renders them safe for clinical use. So homeopathic nosodes, they're prepared in a safe, potentized form by pharmacies or by health professionals, and they've been prescribed as treatment remedies for acute and chronic and intercurrent and miasmatic conditions by homeopaths. They've been used effectively for, oh, a couple of centuries. They're used both in treating serious diseases like distemper since at least 1929 that I could find, but most importantly in preventing them safely and effectively. They can do both. Today, we're gonna to focus on their use as a preventive with healthy animals in the nursery. The proper term for this is homeoprophylaxis. Homeoprophylaxis and vaccination have the same goal, to prevent infectious contagious disease. Homeoprophylaxis is also called HP sometimes. It uses homeopathically attenuated, ultra-dilute disease material made into remedies called nosodes. So nosodes are given orally, whereas core vaccines are injected. And when a nosode is given, the body recognizes the cellular structure and disease imprint, producing an immune response similar to the actual exposure to the disease itself. And although we don't have great tools to prove this scientifically, there are numerous and well-documented examples of how nosodes have been used in homeoprophylaxis to treat the onset of disease all throughout humanity. Nosodes for dogs that we're discussing today, they're made from the raw disease materials like parvovirus, for example. But keep in mind, the virus material is diluted hundreds and thousands of times until it actually can't be located in solution anymore. What's left is the energy, the quantum information that the body actually may have quantum receptors for. Remember that human genome study where they had 97% of our genes that aren't encoding proteins to make us human and they called it junk DNA? Well, some of them may be present simply to handle the fact that we are made of energy and can accept information at that level. Again, it's, it's, it's not chemistry. It's physics informing chemistry. It's information that we can't see, we can't taste or measure, unless we have very sophisticated equipment like Carillion cameras, but it's there. Nosodes can be made from just a single pathogen or from several. When they are made from several, they're usually provided in lower potencies so that their effect is more gentle than if they were higher potencies. And dosing instructions will vary a little bit depending on the product, but they're typically started after weaning and they're given with a loading dose for a few days, then weekly or monthly, and then usually annually. 
I usually send my puppy buyers home with a dosing schedule that they can check off as they dose so they can continue to inform the dog's body about how to react if a pathogen is encountered. So you can't talk about no -sos with also without also talking about traditional injectable vaccines. And so I'm going to share another kind of cool fact with you. There's a company called AmberTech. It's a company whose primary product set was launched to support animals with parvo. And they're very well respected. They've saved a lot of puppies with parvo. And they published this information, quote, vaccinated animals are less likely to get parvo than unvaccinated animals are, but they're much more likely to die from it. And they're much more likely to incur large medical bills for treatment. Whereas unvaccinated animals are more likely to get parvo, but they're much more likely to survive and with much milder symptoms. And in our breeding program and with many of those in natural rearing world, we found that starting an animal off with extreme immune supports, including, of course, ingestion of the mother's colostrum and an excellent prey model raw diet, along with no sods starting after weaning, it can greatly improve disease resistance. So there's another system of medicine that I like a lot in the gentry nursery and in with our adult dogs. These are essential oils, and they're another really excellent tool in the Natural Rearing Breeders Toolkit. They can uh, help keep you out of blue pearl in the middle of the night. And although we need to be especially discretionary with any strong plant medicines during pregnancy and whelping, I'm going to give you a couple that you can add to your toolkit safely. We recommend and use only Young Living because they're actually used by the VMAA vets, and they're considered to be medical grade and appropriately biologically active. Today, I'm just going to give you one essential oil that you can use during whelping and later that if you find to be indispensable like I have, let me know. And that's clary sage. It can help to stimulate contractions during whelping. And as well, it can decrease milk supply when you're weaning to reduce the chance of mastitis. The Veterinary Medical Aromatherapy Association offers certification in veterinary use of essential oils for vets but you do not need to be a vet to take their coursework or be a member. I have been a member and a teacher for them as well on occasion for many years. And I've attended a number of workshops in which we learned of cancer and other cures, cures really, using natural means, including essential oils inhaled, used topically, and even injected by medical professionals. You can't do that at home. Having had a few C-sections over the years, I have just published this graphic to my audience for what I call a uterine tonic. I find it very effective in helping to prevent a second C-section after a previous one. Feel free to screenshot this. In humans, this is called a VBAC. It's, it's, it stands for vaginal birth after C-section. It's also great during the last trimester to tone up the uterus to prepare it for the rigors of whelping. And you'll just use one drop daily on the abdomen for a vaginal birth or a VBAC and the recipe is there for you. This is a picture of the Gentry Boxers Nursery on a typical day with puppies inside, and you'll see the large bottle of Thieves Household Cleaner that's hanging from the whelping pen. There are always two of these. One is on each side. We clean the nursery and we clean the potty area. We clean the raw diet food prep and basically everything with it. It's usually diluted about 30 to one with water, in those bottles for a little extra cleaning power. 40 to 1 is okay for home use. And as anyone who has been around a pile of puppies knows, nurseries can smell due to the fact that lots of babies are being potty trained at the same time. It's basically poopalooza. And we start before the babies are born diffusing a product called Thieves and another one called Purification. We rotate them 24 7. We often use a product called Stress Away along with calcium supports, if the mom has any kind of difficulty settling down and mothering. I have a high-end microscope in a lab, so I'm able to monitor fecals for parasites. If I see evidence of them and not before, I will put paragize on their bellies one to two times daily, and I'll add food-grade diatomaceous earth into their food or their bottles or their weaning mush. And for those breeds who have docked uh, tails, or dew claws removed at birth for the breed standard, 
we use either Mendwell or Owie for healing. The oil blend that we find the most valuable for all animals besides helichrysum is one called Tea Away. All babies and moms go through trauma in the birth process as well as if these medical procedures must be done. And I insist that Tea Away be applied down the spine every day while things are healing for babies and mama dogs. This keeps them from storing trauma in their cells. And again, this may be quantum in nature, but it's very effective. Having been around natural rearing now for multiple generations, I can attest to what the research in the books teach us. We are seeing up to double the lifespan in naturally reared dogs, and it increases with each generation. We see much less itching, allergies, literally no anxiety, more biddable and healthier dogs. And you know, as a breeder, I feel like this improves client loyalty as many of them come to natural rearing breeders because they've lost other purebred dogs at young ages to preventable health diseases and they know it. And once they discover natural rearing, they do not go back through that door to big pharma and kibble raised dogs. It just doesn't happen. And you know, they expect to pay a little more because these are expensive breeding programs and we are front loading immunity and we're sparing no expense. The average price for naturally reared, multi-generation naturally reared dogs especially can be as much as double that of traditionally raised, let's call them backyard breeder dogs. I remember selling puppies from my very first naturally reared litter and having a client literally hand me a blank check for pickup at pickup time and she said anything up to $10,000 was absolutely expected and at the time we were selling our puppies for $2,000 it kind of blew me away. So here's a few examples of dogs that have been naturally reared. A friend of mine raised this boxer on the left named Baron, so I know him personally, and he passed peacefully at the age of 18 and a half, still chasing Frisbees. And the dog in the middle, uh, last I knew, was still going, going strong. Uh, it belongs to a person named Julie Morris in Waco, Texas. And she didn't realize at the time that she was raising the 10th oldest dog in the world at the age of 22 years. And this dog on the right is named Bobby. He's a Portuguese farm dog, and he died in 2023 at the age of 31 years and 163 days of age. He broke the Guinness Book of World Records. He was a farm dog, naturally reared. So this is the, one of the banners I use for my own breeding program because I feel like when these babies are born, they're born so innocent and so pure, and I want to keep it that way. I don't want to be introducing toxins into babies that they then carry their own life and accumulate in their bodies and then pass those along to their offspring if they're bred. I will tell you that I take a lot of flack from people that know me and other breeders and maybe for some of us we encounter a lot of resistance when we want to share things that we know to be true that buck the system and this is one of my favorite things it's on my wall it reminds me to stay the course and help these people one dog at a time it is definitely better to walk alone than with a crowd going in the wrong direction there are many great references that can help you learn more about natural rearing, homeopathics, essential oils, non-toxic uh, ways to control parasites. Uh, please feel free to screenshot this. It's just a small uh, subset of what's out there, but these are things that inform this particular workshop and some of the things that I do at Gentry Boxers and offer in the dog breeder store. So take a look at those and um, avail yourself of those references. There are a couple more references. You might want to take a screenshot of this. Um, I love the Veterinary Medical Aromatherapy Association. It's at vmaa.vet. They can teach you about how to use essential oils in either veterinary practice or in your own home with dogs safely and effectively. They have the largest database of essential oil use in animals anywhere. And there's a book called The Forever Dog that was written by Dr. Karen Becker of Mercola fame and Rodney Habib, Habib, and all their educational sites are just wonderful. 
So if you are a breeder interested in knowing more about natural rearing, or especially if you're a pet parent who thinks that a breeder who's doing natural rearing might be for you, you'll want to find the Natural Rearing Breeder Connection, which is at nrbreeder.com. We help people find those breeders and the clients who want them. We also have a Facebook group called the Natural Rearing Breeder Connection. And uh, you're also welcome to join the Gentry Boxers Natural Rearing Group. That's my own free private Facebook group. I teach in there regularly. And I highly recommend Vital Animal. That's run by Dr. Will Falconer, who is a veterinarian who practiced for, I don't know, 30 years, I think, as a homeopath in Austin. And he has a natural rearing roadmap course at his site. And he has a lot of courses that dig deep into these subjects if you want to know about them. There's a wonderful book called Natural Rearing. It's written by Dr. Jeannie Thomason. She's one of my mentors and also ran the school that I went to, the American Council of Animal Naturopathy. But if you are interested in becoming an animal naturopath, there are several schools that I'm aware of. The Kingdom School of Natural Animal Health, which is um, right now I don't believe is accredited, but they have a curriculum very similar to what I went through. And the Kingdom College of Natural Health, very similar name, but a different school does offer certifications and you can take your boards from them. So this is our last slide. Thanks for sticking with us. Feel free to screenshot this. If you're interested in contacting me, that phone number there is my business landline, regular business hours. We're in the Texas Houston area and uh, there's no texting available on that line. We also run the dog breeder store. If you are a pet parent or a breeder and you're looking for natural rearing supplies, we offer some wonderful things for both the pet parents and the breeders. We also put out an educational newsletter. We try really hard not to spam anybody and there's an opt-in for that at the dog breeder store. And on the dog breeder channel on YouTube, we offer educational videos. They're all free, including this one. If you're interested in my own program for naturally reared puppies, you can find me at gentryboxers.com. You can learn about Young Living Essential Oils under my own sponsorship or that of whoever introduces you to the oils. Uh, ours is at kindredoilers.com. I'm on Facebook under my personal name and also under the Gentry Boxers Natural Rearing Group. And we're just starting on Instagram. And then I'm also a co-founder of the Natural Rearing Breeder Connection with Crystal Beers at nrbreeder.com. Thank you for listening. I hope that this has been educational and enlightening and that you all explore more of this and consider raising your own dog with natural rearing protocols.